I've developed a mnemonic technique where I use produce in alphabetical order to remember things. First thing's an apple, second thing's a banana, and so on. It works pretty well, but I get lost about halfway through. Some sort of memory leak or something. I have an awful memory. I've learned a number of ways to function in spite of it. I drop whatever I'm doing to type reminders into my notes app. I leave projects in visible places in my apartment so I'll remember that I'm supposed to be working on them. If I need more than a single item when I go to the store, I make a list and read it twice over before I head home just to be absolutely sure I don't space out and forget half the things I need. These are all effortful habits I've cultivated through trial and error to compensate for how little I can rely on my brain to grab hold of information and retain it. The extended mind thesis suggests that the way we normally conceive of cognition as a process that only happens inside our skulls is insufficient to characterize the two-way flow of information between our brains and the environment. According to the thesis, all these habits and reminders and so on are just as much a part of my thinking as my frontal cortex. And there's really no meaningful difference between my post-it note shopping list and simply remembering what I need at the store. It's only a matter of where I'm choosing to keep that information. It's a reassuring notion, but I don't quite buy it for a number of reasons. Even if some technology is deeply, intimately bound up in my thought processes, I'm never just deciding whether that thinking will happen inside or outside of my head. By relying on external objects to encode and process my thoughts, I am altering both what I think and what I can think in meaningful ways. There's no set of diary entries that can fully capture the feeling of being deathly ill with norovirus or the smell of my parents' house when I was five. Any thoughts that I have about those experiences will be colored by which bits made sense in text. If I don't get the words quite right in the moment, I might well end up remembering those experiences in distorted ways or ways that didn't happen. Even the things I can capture faithfully, at their most effective, will only ever manage to be prompts for my squishy human memory. If I don't actually recall how I felt sitting and writing those words on the page, I might be able to picture the scene perfectly as though I were reading it in a novel. They may be lovely descriptive words, but they might as well have been written by a stranger. The availability of technology to supplement or replace our memories hasn't just affected how and what we think, it's also changed the way we think about thinking. For much of history, in many cultures, remembering was seen as the mark of a formidable intellect. Cicero, Kaoji, Muhammad al-Bukhari, and St. Thomas Aquinas were all deeply respected for their capacity for recall, in a way you or I might find peculiar. I mean, if I could recite the Analects of Confucius by heart, or quote any Bible verse from memory, would you reckon that made me some brilliant scholar, or an obsessive weirdo with a neat party trick? Before books were as cheap and ubiquitous as they are now, the only way you could reliably reference or build on a bit of knowledge that wasn't in your expansive, private, handwritten library was to stash it up here. Those who could marshal the attention and patience to commit things to memory were well equipped for intellectual work, others less so, as the raw information necessary for that work might be locked in some remote monastery half a continent away. Gutenberg's printing press changed all of that. In a few hundred years, we went from Aquinas, who was revered for his ability to recite long passages verbatim, to Montaigne, an esteemed Renaissance thinker and philosopher who quipped, a good memory is generally joined to a weak judgment. The widespread use of the table of contents further reduced the scholarly demand for memory. The index almost removed it altogether, provided you knew what you were looking for. With tools like large language models and Google, you don't even need that much. Mash a couple poorly spelled words that are somewhere close to a vague idea into a text box, and nine times out of ten, the thing you wanted to know will appear instantly. Information has gone from a thing that you memorize, to a thing that you know where to look for, to a thing that falls into your lap if you ask for it. That shift has indisputably been a net benefit for humanity. Quicker and easier access to knowledge, regardless of an individual's skill at memorizing things, has been an incredible boon to almost everything humans do. But that ease has also changed our relationship with memory. If we always have the option to look something up with a device that's within arm's reach, it's no wonder we're mostly unconcerned whether facts live outside or inside our skulls. What's really important is what new things we can create or imagine, not what we can remember, right? Unfortunately, for me and my note-taking apps, one relies almost entirely on the other. 
Let's look a little closer at a number of distinct cognitive abilities that all get lumped together under the term memory. There's procedural or muscle memory, the sort of thing you use for typing on a keyboard or riding a bike. There's episodic memory, recalling a specific event that you experienced, like that one time I got sick. There's semantic memory, the recollection of facts and definitions. Out of all those different abilities, technology seems a poor substitute for anything but semantic memory. If you didn't know how tall Mount Everest is, or the square root of two, or your mother's birthday, you can use Wikipedia, a calculator, or your phone's calendar and look them up. But that process can only really work in one direction. Without having them stored in your head, there's no way you'd be able to recognize those numbers if you stumbled onto them in the wild somewhere. 8,849 meters? Never heard of them. In many respects, our capacity for dreaming up new ideas or recognizing new patterns is circumscribed by that reflexive aha feeling when you're reminded of something you've learned or experienced before, what's called recognition memory. And it depends entirely on what you've managed to store in your noggin. You can't tell something's happening again if you can't remember the first time it happened. And if you haven't retained any research, you might spend many sleepless nights agonizing over some invention only to realize you're the millionth person to reinvent trains. It seems that even with our most impressive technology assisting us, memory remains an essential precondition for thought and for situating events in a broader context to make sense of them. And here's the rub. It's also how we situate ourselves. You've probably heard stories of the rare individuals suffering from severe anterograde amnesia who have lost the capacity to form new memories, whether that's what they had for breakfast this morning or what they were talking about five minutes ago or the death of their spouse last year. Their identities, who they are, is forever frozen at that last thing they remember. They can still interact with and respond to events, but it's an unsettling ghost of what we think of as consciousness, rehearsing the same activities, the same conversations, and the same reactions over and over. In order to meaningfully persist through time, instead of merely haunting a series of new moments, our minds need to be marked by the passing of time. We have to remember what has happened to us, and recognize when we're seeing echoes of our past experiences and things that we've learned to fully be ourselves. That might sound like a great reason to take photos, videos, notes, anything that might help you remember as much as you can, to hold on to your personal history as tightly as possible with whatever tools are at hand, but it's not quite that simple. Research suggests that cognitive offloading, the practice of reducing cognitive overhead by making lists, taking pictures, scribbling down notes, and so on, improves our instantaneous performance in many cognitive tasks. If you tell someone to memorize a list of words, they'll have a harder time solving puzzles while they're waiting to repeat the words back to you than someone who can free up that mental capacity by writing the words down first. But that performance boost comes at a cost. If you take someone's list away, they'll recall fewer of those words than someone who simply memorized them. They won't recognize as many of them in a lineup and are more susceptible to being convinced that something was on the list when it really wasn't. It seems that when we make the decision to store memories in our technology rather than in our heads, we get exactly what we wished for. Which compels me to ask, what does it mean if who we are is, at least in part, constituted by what we can remember? If I spill coffee on my notebook, or if my phone runs out of batteries for a bit, or even if I'm just focused on talking to you instead of staring at photos I snapped on my last vacation, am I somehow lessened? If we want to be the fullest, most vibrant version of ourselves, should we be paying closer attention and exercising our memories more? Would some of the time we normally dedicate to novelty and news be better spent recollecting and cementing what we've experienced already? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to blah blah subscribe blah share, and don't stop thinking.